screen. Okay, um, so this is a new blank instance that uh, Modern has just created. Uh, we're going to uh, do just a quick, um, I think a repeat of what uh, Bob had done, but also um, uh, continue briefly on what uh, probably has to be done following, uh, following on. So first, like Bob hinted out that we have a, a documentation on the, on the on the on GitHub uh, that defines exactly what um, uh, what has to be done during the birthing process. Uh, so I'm just going to I don't know whether I can share with you guys the link quickly. I don't know whether he had shared. He hadn't. Uh, the DHIS two tools. Uh, the ng and um, we normally recommend people to actually first do the batting process uh, which is uh, accessible and just to make it more secure and i'm just going to follow uh, briefly what we had already actually documented and like just on a blank instance of course uh, bob had already done this i'm just copying and uh, this is my new instance uh, just hopefully the size is Visible enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. okay. I want to reach where uh, Bob had already reached uh, just quickly. Then we can continue from there uh, by giving some bit of explanations. I think Bob had already given a lot of explanation. And uh, of course, we create a user, add this user to the sudo, and all those bits. Uh, so as it gets done. Right now I'm logged in as a root. Uh, so, so I'm just going to create myself with my password. So you can complete uh, just the basic other processes and confirm. So now we have created a user, but of course this user is just a basic user that needs to be added into the pseudo group. Uh, so this command specifically adds that user to the pseudo group. Um, so I've created a username called Sokaya and that is it. So right now I'm part of the user just to test normally. Uh, you can switch to that user and see if you can do ls maybe viva uh, lib or something and then if you can if you can log in that should give you so at least this shows that at least you can this user is basically um a, it falls under the under, under pseudo group then um the other bit is now to send uh your key uh, that is very important. I already have my keyword. So this process is normally um, for those who don't have even a key gen um, on their uh, existing laptops or computers that they are using to connect to the server. Uh, but if they have already, then they just skip that process and go to the next process. Uh, that is this. But before uh, you can send successfully the, uh, your public key to the server, uh, it's important that you have uh, for a directory under that user account that you've created. So right now I'm going to make a, a, a dot .ssh um, folder in my home directory so that we have uh, this folder is what is going to receive our authorized keys uh, that we have. Um, I also have on my laptop, uh, my home directory where 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 i get um uh, the public key and already so, uh, it uh, looked like we can't see the two last line of your terminal you can't see what the two last line on your terminal when you are typing we don't see anything 
you don't see i've kind of zoomed in a bit can you see now hello hello just the, the half of the last line half of the last line yeah i've zoomed in a bit uh, so it's a bit Okay. Um, a suggestion for Jaime is to make the terminal a little smaller. Can you see this? Though it will become good. 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 Thank you. Yes. Good. Thank you. So uh, on that command, on that command that I've just copied to send the uh, the the thing, we have to get the uh, of course, my username is now the new username that I've created. So that I'm going to change to Sokaya. And then the IP address, let me just get quickly from Morton uh, this. Quickly this. And replace this. OK. So. I can send my code. Okay, so now I can actually try to, right now I'm able to log in using my public key, I suppose, public key plus uh, password or something like that. So if I exit, but just to confirm that we have have uh, everything um, a little request for zooming a little bit or increasing the fonts for your uh, terminal window all right okay zooming in will just take us back to the issue of yeah can you still see uh Stephen, hi this is Jaime. Sorry. The problem when, we, when you have a full screen is that uh, because we have zoom uh, things, the, the zoom controls, we cannot see the last screen. So you can zoom, but just make the terminal window a bit smaller so it doesn't reach the bottom part of the computer. And that should be all right. Okay. That's, that's the only problem okay. we're having. That's the reason we cannot see your last, your last lines. But you can zoom in uh, okay. as long as the terminal does not take the, the bottom part of the screen. So let me stop around here. That should be perfect. See? Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when I zoom in, it also goes off. So um, you see we have uh, my, uh, my authorized keys. If I'm to just quickly, this is my public key. Oh, it does not come through. Sorry, let me go to my home directory. Um, So I have my key there in, in my local laptop. So when I send uh, from here, I think this command has to be run from the from the local computer. I think I'd run from the, the other side way, the other way around. Uh, so I put the password. Um, uh, there's a message saying that you're in your local host. Is that uh, right? Yeah, on this, this is my, my remote server. This in, in black is what I have on my computer. So the command, I think I'd run from the the server itself that's why the content was blank but now i have run from my laptop and just transferred uh, i think it should be trans should be the content of this file should be now there as you can see it's now loaded on the remote server um just to go back to this site i can log in try to use now my user account at this ip address the port is still the same. Okay. As you can see, uh, the login uh, 
pop up for the password has now changed to the key. And now you have to put the password of the key. And that's normally what we, so we test uh, with the password of the key. If you're able to log in like that, so that should be uh, guaranteed that uh, the key works. And then the next step is to basically uh, disable password login, but also securing that uh, a file from this from that remote server, making sure that the ownership, uh, the access right is on the read only with the uh, 0600. The permission is changed to read only. And then the other bit is to turn on, turn off uh, password authentication and also disable root login. Right now we have two users that can log in into the server, the root and, and the new account that we've just created. We want to disable that and we just edit the file which is found under that uh, directory, etc, ssh. So sudo nano, uh, that should open first the file that we have. And the first thing that you, you, you see from there is disabling uh, root pass, uh, root login by just changing the yes value to a no, okay? So if you turn it to no, and you complete that, uh, that already disables uh, root login. Uh, you could first try to make sure that you're okay. Then you also look at the password, password login has to be uh, turned off by default. Um, it's a yes. So you look at this password authentication is a yes. And uh, you uncomment that and turn it to a no. That will only guarantee or, or accept um, login via, via the public key. Okay. Then uh, definitely you, you restart your SSH uh, services just to make sure that your new configurations are loaded and uh, take effect. Okay, so right now, I think I should not be able to log in uh, via password, but rather just only via uh, the... So right now we are still on port uh, 22. And the next thing is of course, to try to secure the port. This is the default port that everybody knows. And uh, it's important that uh, we change it just to make sure that uh, people don't guess it uh, uh, first time. Of course, the port of SSH is where people normally try to enter via, and the default one is port um, 22. It's still on the same file um, that, as you can see on the first uh, 10 or 11 line, this one, uh, you uncomment that port and change it to any other port. We normally, uh, use a to two but you can try to change it to any port that you feel more secure uh, there has been some guidance around this port that should be below 1000 um, given the fact that ports that are above that side um, has some usage which is a bit uh, less or, or requires less security on the data and the like um, so we put our a to two so that is our new port and then we restart again the service. So right now, if I log out, um, I'm not able to actually access uh, this uh, server from the default port 222 and also using password. So just to just check it out together. Right now, um, I've logged out and just to log in using a root just to test this connection refuse on port 2020. And if I do still, I know the port and I try to, to log in, you can see that it requires public key and root is not accepted. So if I go to, I change the, the user now, we should be able to, okay, to log in, put in the, the key password and we should be inside at port 822. And also, I think this is where uh, Bob had uh, just left, right? Oh, he had finished up with the uh, firewalls and the like. 
Of course, the next step is to just enable that, make sure that the firewall works and allows that, uh, that port. Here, it's important that, uh, it's important that, um, sorry, you don't log out before uh, allowing that. So you can see that our firewall is now active. So if you log out here right now, and um, you have not configured uh, it to accept port 822, it becomes a bit tricky. So the next command that uh, allows uh, port 82 is that one. And this is just a description of what that uh, command is trying to do on the, on the port. So just quickly. Okay, now I should have allowed that port 822 instead of so just having it blank. Uh, just to restart. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, a single command that this, uh, that will restart uh, or reload the service. So you have to first disable and enable it again. Okay, using that. So that means already our server is quite a bit uh, right now um, stable enough and, and secure. And that's what we coined as the, uh, the batting process. Um, what is next is now to try to bring the, the DHS tools on this server, uh, which, is, um, which requires a git. We haven't yet uh, packaged uh, this in, in a single command where you can just easily go and type uh, some command, uh, then that will pull it onto the server. So we normally uh, require uh, the process of uh, installing first the git you know, onto your blank server or at least updating it. Uh, so right now we have our Git on the server and um, the next step is to uh, just bring us back to the code uh, that will allow us to download this, uh, these files, uh, the, the, uh, the script that we have. If I can go back quickly this side. Hopefully. Let me just go back here. Okay. Now to install this script, uh, this is the installation step now. Our server, given the fact that it's now uh, very uh, stable or secured from any other illegal access and the like, the next step is to, of course, to come out and uh, we are using just the clone. We're just getting the whole entire project, the Git project for now. Um, I'm just going to copy this and in my home directory, uh, just clone the, uh, the ng tool onto my folder. Uh, and that's Steven? It. Yes, please. Steven? Yes, I yes. don't know if maybe we, we can talk about uh, the LXC concept, uh, just to make a demonstration of how we can create a simple container. Pardon? Maybe Pardon? deploy image inside. Can we just maybe talk about the elixir? Uh, like Bob was doing, I don't know if this was uh, the thing he uh, was processing to do. Just show how we can set up elixir, create a simple container, container an empty one, and uh, how we can yeah. just uh, go in and go out before setting the full step. Bob, it is a suggestion. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, is it, it's a continuation of this process. And um, the LXC concept of containers and the like, I think had already been explained briefly by Bob, uh, but uh, to start creating it inside, um, this uh, tool automatically creates for you um, the best uh, containers that are required uh, for the process that, uh, uh, for, the, for the deployment process or installation of, the, of, of this entire DHIS2 environment. So uh, I first wanted to run uh, maybe just a few things before we can actually do. Um, right now, definitely, of course, there's no any LXC containers in, in the thing. Like you cannot see uh, a command that should, I don't think it should work here because it is not installed. And uh, the next, of course, oh, as you can see, it's there, but just nothing is there. Okay. So um, within the, script that we have just pulled in 
into our folder, like DHIS2 tools ng, uh, we'll see a couple of things, scripts, a couple of scripts that uh, under setup uh, that really has been automated somehow to to take on with the uh, the whole setup of, of, of the environment. As you can see, we have uh, shell scripts that are, that are responsible for creating uh, containers. Uh, the details of it, I think Bob will maybe come and highlight a bit, uh, but if uh, maybe just quickly, uh, it's just a complex thing for non-programmers non or non-shell scripters. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, normally, uh, of course, we have to configure uh, the storage image that it has to be used uh, by the containers, the LXC. And um, this defines by default what operating system uh, we should be using, the version. And we've indicated just uh, Tomcat, uh, no, Ubuntu 20.04. And it will basically create for us uh, three base uh, containers, one for proxy, uh, one for uh, the Postgres database, and then another one for, for, mon for monitoring, though it will not show up. And um, so we also have uh, the actual DHIS2 tools commands uh, that are found in the script. Uh, if for some of you have been using the DHIS2 tools, the first versions, uh, you know, you just type DHIS2 shutdowns, DHIS2 startup, DHIS2 deploy one, right? All those commands are actually within this uh, install script that is there. And um, some of the scripts are part of the, um, they're called from other scripts, um, like the LXD setup is one that, that will call the one that will create for you the containers and the like. So we have just few basic commands that we have to use out of this uh, to create, to be able to create our, our containers. Uh, looking at the uh, documentation, of course, there are a few adjustments that has to be done uh, on your containers, or on your setup. Uh, this is where the domain aspect of uh, the requirement of a, of a fully uh, qualifiable domain name is important. Uh, because we need to have something that is fully accessible uh, from, from the server and should be actually. So if I opened, I first make uh, a copy. Let me just do using here, the sample. Inside the config here, you should be seeing a default, sorry. You should be seeing um, uh, these are default configuration that we have. And uh, we just have to rename this a bit or copy, make a copy containers uh, dot sample to containers dot JSON. And then we should be having our uh, containers dot JSON. Now, uh, as you can see, uh, we have three default uh, containers that we have. And uh, our subsequent uh, command that we shall be using will create for us the proxy server, a uh, Postgres server, and the monitor server, I mean containers, uh, that will be running at the various softwares that are embedded within. The Apache proxy um, defines a proxy that will not be using Nginx or any other proxy servers, but rather Apache 2 servers. As, as the proxy server. And then the Postgres uh, definitely defines the container that will hold uh, your database server based on Postgres. And the, the basic requirement or parameters for each container just to be created well is the name of the container and an IP address, and then the type of the container. We, we currently support uh, the three, we have the Tomcat, we have the, we, no, I mean, we have the Postgres, we have the Apache, the proxy server, and we also have Nginx proxy, but that has not been fully tested yet. And then we have the monitoring uh, container. 
those are the types that we have. And then uh, we have, so there are three things that we just have to change on this. Um, we have to change according to our server details, the FQDN, uh, that is the fully qualifiable domain name. Let me call this, um, I'm going to call this as uh, demo dot Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Hear me, I've already set up a domain for you. If you go back to the Slack, the shared Slack uh, VM, uh, he has already set up a domain. On the Slack? Uh, on the Slack, yes, 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 yes. Okay. On the, the, the Bob Jolly of Clement, uh, if you go a little bit up. Yeah, there's a, there's a domain there you can use. Uh, all of this, eh? Yes, thanks. I can use this? Yes, that, that should be okay already, I think. Yes, uh, yes, please. Right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So thanks. So I go, I, I'm going to use this as our domain name. So I come and change this uh, here. Sorry, it's, it should just be the domain name, not the full link. So ensure that you don't have these uh, URL parameters and the like protocols and the like. And then uh, the other thing that we change is the email, the admin email address, of course, so that you, you will be receiving uh, uh, the SSL certificate uh, notifications whenever they expire. This is one, one way of using it and also admin notifications on the containers that you'll be creating or the, the entire environment. So I can put uh, mine, uh, have that as my email. Then the time zone. Um, unfortunately, we decided to use, <laughs> originally we had the Africa Dar es Salaam. So here, this TZ was confusing the entire team. Uh, we, were, we thought it was a short for time zone, not for Tanzania. So someone from Uganda would put UG, for someone from Kenya would put KY and they're like, but that was not the case. So this TZ is a, a time zone and you have to define which uh, city or country or continent you're coming from. Uh, for my case, I would put uh, Kampala. Okay. There's a time zone. It should be an existing time zone. Uh, so you have that. And basically, uh, we recommend just to stop there. The rest of the other things down, uh, we don't recommend you to change because it basically gives you some bit of space and the like. And also one, what we've provided is that um, the IP addresses have been given some ranges. Um, so Postgres uh, containers will run from, you know, from 20 up to maybe around 29 if you have as many Postgres containers that you're creating. And then uh, we have two for proxy. Proxy is basically only always one, but then uh, we've intentionally left out uh, from three up to 19 to support the IP address for our DHIS to Tomcat containers that you will be creating. You remember Bob says that we will create as many uh, Tomcat containers to be able to hold um, the, the DHIS2 instances that you have for training, for development, for and, and, and all those bits. And that will fit within uh, those IP, IP address ranges. But you can always define your own as well and come out with one that is, may not be within these ranges and the like. So if I, sh if I close that and uh, just quickly looking at the next, of course, we've, we are done with this, the top three. You can read that the, uh, we, we, we recommend you not to go down below the three lines and the like. So our next step is to basically create us um, the LXD uh, containers and the like. Of course, just by running, let me go back one step. Uh, in the setup, of course, run uh, LXD setup. LXD setup. We expect this to create for us the, the first three uh, containers that we have uh, defined within the containers of JSON file. 
So let's wait quickly. It's now creating a proxy, a proxy of type uh, Apache proxy. It will download for us the Ubuntu 2024, set it up, and also install the necessary um, software that is required to run an Apache an Apache server within it, so that you don't need to go and again start installing manually at uh, the various software that is required to run Apache server. So it's still reading the file, so let's see. Okay, it's done. So this should take us roughly uh, maybe a few minutes per container just because it's pulling up. And the good thing with the LXD, once it has downloaded once, the next process will not uh, try to download. It will use the local copy and try to install with what it has. Uh, so it will download for you once. Each of the content, much as you have as many containers as possible, it will just reuse what it already has in its history of what has been downloaded. Uh, we are done with, I think we're done with creating the the proxy. It's probably now creating for us the, the next container. Oh, it's configuring the Apache 2, we can see. Um, Okay, so you can see the next uh, container being created. Uh, yes, Ali. Someone has a hand. Uh, yes, please. Hand. Hi. Yeah, so while this is installing uh, i just wanted to uh, appreciate your explanation actually i'm following very well than bob's first approach yeah so what i wanted to uh, to comment is uh, to say i think it's better if uh, we actually open up the scripts and then explain what's happening like each and everything uh, that's written in the scripts uh, unlike just running the scripts okay yeah, thank you. Let's first run it out, and then I'll just uh, explain briefly. Uh, briefly there. Okay. Let's just wait for it to finish. Uh, also have an of course, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if everybody is comfortable with looking at the script. I don't know whether that was the plan for Bob uh, to go that far. But it's okay, I can explain quickly what each script is doing. Let's first wait and complete. Uh, somehow this process is a bit slow. I don't know whether it is a, the server speed the side as well, but it should be it should take normally a shorter time uh, to, to, to create those three uh, containers that we have created. I'll see it's almost getting done with the Postgres container.
So as you can see, it's just created the Postgres is done. Uh, the next is uh, creating the, the third and last container, uh, the morning uh, monitor that will be used to monitor the entire environment, um, both and all the other containers that has been uh, created, plus the host machine uh, once fully configured. Um, Yes, Jamie, your hand is up. Yes. So yes, quickly to, to mention that, as you see, uh, when Stephen was doing the setup, he had to include that domain name eh, that we use. That's the reason yes. you were asked to have a server and also have control over our DNS. Uh, if you do not have, so on top of the server, you should have this. If you do not have their free services, I listed one of them in the chat. But if you see at one point, I just uh, check and it was uh, at one point the, the, the setup was saying uh, acquiring SSL certificates. So if you do not have that uh, domain name, that step I think will break because it requires to have a full qualified domain name that is going to be linked to the HTTPS certificate. Just wanted to mention that because in case you run this without that, uh, it will probably break and make sure that when you get the server, you also have access to a DNS zone yeah. or if not yeah. use a free service like uh, the one I listed there. Sorry, Stephen, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thank you. And, and also, at some point, you will note that we kind of uh, left out the process of SSL creation out of this process, just to make sure that you do it by yourself and be cautious around the uh, the, the rate of failure with the less encrypt. Because we're using less encrypt, um, normally it limits the number of um, attempts that you do to uh, generate the SSL certificate within a specific amount of time. So as if they notice that you're keeping on generating every time, uh, most likely they will block you. And that means you will have to get another domain name and probably with that process might be long and like. So as you can see, we are done with the setup of the, of the, of the container. Hello, um, hello Stefan. I, yes, please. Yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted also to add an, uh, uh, with, uh, the, uh, the previous presenter that has said that you need to have the domain, but again, if you have the, uh, if you are, have purchased uh, the server to those clouds uh, like Linode and the and and the Contab and the like, are you? I, I was just I just pasted the the command where you can be able to get those uh, free norms that they normally provide. So if you don't have yeah. the domain mapped at the moment, you can just use that one. So I just yeah. uh, put it that command in a Slack and so that anyone can use it for me while I may be purchasing for the domain. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Trizo. I think that is very key. Most of the virtual providers, actually, all the cloud providers can will give you another another alternative uh, subdomain within their uh, domains or something that you can also use to get the, but of course it will be having uh, funny names that may not give you what you want. So it's important that, so as you can see, uh, we have our three uh, containers now created and they are now running at the ports that we've defined within the containers of JSON. Uh, just quickly to, before we can proceed, uh, like someone requested, um, remember we ran out uh, the LXD uh, setup script, okay? So if I just open that, it's basically small. Uh, as you can see, but tries to pull out other things uh, that um, are more into uh, the LXD uh, setup 
script basically it does uh, the basic system uh, update process and upgrade of all the packages that are within uh, the host machine or something and then installs for us uh, the lxd okay lxd is uh, basically what lxc they basically we, we use the word interchangeably but this kind of gives the base of what lxc containers actually run on and uh, so as you can see just install that and initialize uh, the LXD um, okay, environment within the host machine. Once that is done, then uh, of course sets up uh, basic um, uh, a firewall on this um, on the, on the on the disk space that has been uh, uh, defined. This is a bridge uh, that will will link the two uh, the host machine uh, with uh, the containers. So that you are able to access your containers from the host machine, and also the host machine can be able to access. Uh, I mean, the containers can also be able uh, can be able to access uh, the host machine, and then definitely reads out or runs or puts up this creates you know this uh, co create containers of SH. It will start to process it. Um, it's now calling the next uh, script that is create containers. The one we just looked at, which has a number of uh, script that we have. So if I look at quickly create uh, containers.ch, uh, remember we already defined our on the containers.json. Uh, we defined our container that we need to create. Um, but also, basically, we have to define some basic uh, variables that we have. The first few things is looking at variables, uh, are defining the variables and what the basic command that it does. Um, for example, the IP root, uh, which is trying to find out what IP are in each of these containers, the JSON, the one that was defined, okay? And then tries to create an, an attach it to the bridge uh, so that you're able to uh, access using the IP address that was configured. Uh, by default, LXD, LXC uh, can install for you and assign for you an IP address that if you have not specified. But if you have specified, it's, it's basically the concept of um, an automated, an automatic IP address that is assigned to a device that you you come that you bring on board, or um, a static IP address. So what we've done for these three uh, default containers. It's basically define static IP addresses, but also make sure that they are accessible within the host and um, and and the and the containers themselves. And of course, uh, the firewall will try to make sure that it is accepted and accessible within there. Now, um, after that, uh, you you'll see um, we start to install some bit of uh, files. Um, here we are installing unzip. Um, to just support this unzipping of certain files that could have been zipped. And then we have ODT and JQ. JQ is a, is a JSON query thing, tool, uh, that will read the JSON file and um, process what is inside, okay? It is used somewhere down, um, just as you can see this side, okay? And assign it to a variable or something. The audit queue is probably used for auditing. Uh, that one I don't understand much, but the JQ is a tool that is used for reading the JSON file. Remember, uh, then the other bit is pass uh, config dot, uh, dot this. This file uh, will read the will read the configuration file that we just created or edited, um, and then keep the variable. Okay keep the content into a variable. Once that is done, you're able to actually read. As you can see, we have for each and the value that comes up, uh, we get the value, the key, uh, the value, uh, the environment name. This is reading from another, let me just close this and we see as config, okay. As you can see, we are loading the config file on the first line. Okay. 
And then um, we have already assigned these two environment variables that we are going to be using. We know that the name of a container is this, 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 and that, and that. And every content has been assigned a variable so that we can easily use that in the... So basically this uh, script sets up a global variable that is accessible within uh, the entire directory, but also allows you to use it in any other uh, subsequent script that you'll be using. Already we have designed, we, we have already um, assigned them to key uh, key variables that we, as you can see, proxy. The proxy is using the confirm the config. It reads what is what is the what's the proxy uh, monitoring and all those bits. And those are already defined in the config uh, containers of JSON file. They are all part coming from this file and already they have been assigned. Now, once that is done, we are in create containers, okay? It reads and puts these values, okay? So for each of the configuration that has come from the file, basically, it assigns it to another variable, key values, and then assigns it to the default um, LXC profile. This is a command that we used to actually start to create a what? The containers that we do. And then uh, the next step uh, will then now do the actual assignment of all these variables on each of the containers. Um, this, remember we've defined our guest OS as 20.04. This command that I've highlighted is basically the one that actually starts. If you are not using this script, you can just create your own um, on LXC, LXD uh, container using that command, LXC init Ubuntu. You can also do CentOS, you can do Windows and the like, as long as they are images for the LXC. Um, so right now we are, we are saying, create for me an LXC container uh, and initialize it with an Ubuntu operating system uh, whose version is 20.04. Of course, that variable is defined up as 20.04. And the name, remember our name is coming from the containers.json for now. And we're creating it dynamically. So that name will be replaced by the three names of each of the three uh, containers that we had defined within the uh, JSON containers.json. So if I'm creating proxy, it will be create LXC init Ubuntu 20.04 proxy. And then it will attach the, the configuration that was, that was also defined the bridge name, and then the name of the, the container, and then that. So these are the networking commands that are normally required to attach an IP address along the bridge so that you can be able to access the container that you're creating uh, within or from the, from the host machine. Once that is done, now we, the next section is basically trying to do uh, specific commands for each of the containers that we are that we are looking for, um, you, you see the first thing is checking if the container you're creating is a proxy. If the type has some word proxy on it, okay. The format is that if we are creating an nginx uh, proxy, then where you see star will be in a nginx proxy in the containers of JSON. So here we are saying if a type has uh, something underscore proxy. Then, and the, the firewalls and all those bits are, are working properly, then do these commands that are within this. Now, this is specific to the proxy um, container. And uh, as you can see, uh, we're reading the rules and all those things that are defined within the uh, firewalls for proxy. Definitely, we, we expect the proxy to be our entry point to all the other containers. So the configuration is basically different. Uh, so it reads out uh, the, what was being defined in uh, the firewall for, uh, in the firewall for proxy and puts it under the normal host machines uh, firewall or proxy or in the container, within the container for proxy and defines that before the rules. So that's uh, before the rules, I think uh, those good networking um, experts within here can best explain that these are rules that probably are checked before 
starting to run uh, certain things. I hope that is what it is. I am not sure very much, but I think that is what I understand. And then once that is done, you you see it puts it in the uh, the networking range and all those bits, and then finish. But the most important bit is that it starts to it will now this will start the LXC container that will have been created, and then uh, do some bit of you know NS lookup for your domain name that you will have defined just to test that the the container is accessible from the what uh, from the we had actually been using pinging uh, but pinging was becoming a, a big a bit of a problem uh, where we try to ping the from the host machine we try to ping the container that we've created but sometimes we find that it's actually not responding within time uh, that's why we try to do an NS lookup of this URL just to, if it can access, then the networking has been uh, fully done very well. And that means from within the uh, container that has been created, we are, we are able to actually access the outside world uh, from the internal container. Then, um, so there are certain other things. So this is for monitoring, for monitoring. As you can see, this section does for, for monitoring. It basically has just separate configurations. Just try to define separate configurations. And then um, any post setup scripts that are there. If uh, containers has post setup, uh, for example, you could be having another process that, we, that is meant to clean up the old entire configuration, then definitely it will use that. You can see there's nothing almost, but just tries to, to just create and stop it there. Okay. Then, um, of course, for type Muni, uh, this uh, there are some other commands that we need to install some basic um, uh, things in it. Uh, the Muni node itself within it, and that will automatically install it and and configure it within with the IP address that has been defined with the range within the range that has been defined and allows it to actually start running and monitor each of these. Uh, as you can see, it starts and like, so this is our script for basically in installing the entire um, content, the, the number of containers. I've not seen here the one for Postgres. Has anyone seen for Postgres? This side, it should also be there so that it defines things that uh, will run on Postgres instance. I don't seem to see here, um, but basically uh, this script looks at custom uh, requirements for each of the of the containers and then do the installation separately, the execution of the commands. So that is basically the uh, that create container uh, command, which which is initiated or called from the LXD setup. Now, once that is done, as you can see, we have. Um, that uh, so we also have the next script uh, which uh, currently as I, as we note on the tool there's no command as you can see uh, that normally allows you to start actually running uh, the dhis2 commands like what we used to do uh, with the old uh, dhis2 commands or dhis tools commands like dhis2 uh, shut down deploy war and all those bits of things so referring back to the, uh, the next step, after running, of course, we will finish with this. Um, the next step is basically to run the install script. The install script has a list. This is what will install for us the, the various commands that we'll be using uh, from the DHIS2 tools. These are custom commands that uh, we should be, so it should do install script um, I put on my password okay so as you can see it has installed the script and completed successfully now I think I should even be uh, able to access some as you can see these are the commands that we have uh, DHIS2 backup 
DHIS2 create instance, DHIS2 DB activities. Uh, we have deleting instance, deploying while, log view to see your logs, restoring a database, and also um, the one that actually tries to um, deal with the monitoring, uh, mooning, and the like. So looking at uh, the install script, okay, install script. Uh, you can see that uh, this is what it basically does. We're just copying what we have in our script and putting it in the uh, user bin. And we are creating the environment variable so that your commands are accessible from the terminal or within the environment. And uh, we, we first make in under the etc uh, under user local a directory called DHIS where we'll put all our files there, the commands that we'll be doing the actual execution of the task that we want. Uh, basically, uh, this script is what uh, what supports uh, all this process uh, of installing the script. Now we have our scripts uh, uh, accessible from the terminal, okay? And um, definitely uh, we are almost to the, okay? the next step of now starting to actually start the entire process okay so like you said uh, you should now be able to access your go to this and all those bits but we haven't yet created um a dhis2 instance okay uh the other the other scripts that are there are like deleting uh delete Okay, if we just look at it, what, is, what, what it does, this will allow you to delete your containers uh, that you have. So just looking at what we have, this, con this script uh, should be able to delete for you the entire um, containers that are there and then allows you to start afresh. Okay, uh, of course the X, the, if you don't want to use the script and you want to delete only maybe one, one container, uh, that is what uh, that's what you can um, use to delete a container. Um, the dollar C is actually the name of the container. Okay, uh, so you would say delete LXC delete force forcing is if it is running it will stop it and then uh, delete force delete the container. That's why we use it there just to avoid any failure that is there. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically um, the overview of that uh, thing. Now that we have our commands uh, of the DHIS2 tools uh, available within the, uh, the server, uh, we should be able to proceed to um, an installation of our um, DHIS2 or Tomcat containers. Remember, at the minimum, we need to have basically four containers. Already the, the, the three are already in, but now uh, the one that will actually hold uh, our Tomcat, uh, which will then run the, the DHS2 war files, is what we need to be creating. And um, the commands that we'll use to basically create uh, a Tomcat uh, container, or, which is basically the DHS2 instance, is uh, this, okay, DHIS2 create instance, okay? What we require in, in this command are some basic parameters. Uh, we, we allow you to define um, the, name of the, the name of the container that you want or the name of the DHIS2 instance that you, you're, you're, you're planning to create. And then you also give it an IP address Okay, based on the ranges that you have. And then you also give it uh, the database container that you have. You remember the architecture of uh, the one Bob was showing where we have multiple pros, uh, Postgres containers and also multiple uh, Tomcat containers, multiple those. So you are free to create as many containers that uh, for Postgres, but then when you're creating now the actual DHIS2, it is important that you really point for us to the right 
Postgres that uh, containers that will be holding the data or where the database will be created. So uh, just uh, to keep Stan, okay. I think you're breaking up a bit. Yeah, someone was calling on my phone. Sorry. Um, yeah. To create instance. Uh, so you will remember the, the parameters that we have, right? So if I try to do enter, I think it should give us some bit of what we need to include. Okay. Uh, the instance name, the IP address, the Postgres container. Okay. This gives us some bit of uh, an idea of what we need to uh, run uh, when we are creating an, a new instance. The options that are required uh, is basically the, uh, that, uh, the instance name, the IP address is kind of optional because it automatically, uh, of late now we allow this to be optional, right? as you can see, but the name of the container is, is key that you define. This is optional. It becomes uh, applicable normally when you have only one Postgres container or something. But it would be important if you have more than one Postgres container, then you define for us the Postgres that you are trying to use, uh, the Postgres container that you're going to use to link up with the, the DHI instance that you're creating. So um, let's do it again. Instance create, create instance. Uh, of course, our host name now, we're going to call it um, demo, okay? And then um, my IP address, I can leave it, but let me just create, I want to start from 192.168.0.10, okay? Just start 192.168.0.10. And then I can put the Postgres. Our container, which is Postgres, for for Postgres, and then I hit this. So as you can see, it does a lot of things that are already that are, are requirements of DHIS to uh, deployment. Um, looking at this, it seems it has gone into the Postgres container, created a database named Demo on the Postgres container. And um, it has altered the role. That means that it has assigned uh, the entire database role and ownership to the demo user. And also, there's an extension that we normally require uh, for the latest DHIS2 versions, the post GIS. It has already added it <clears throat> and also applied, um, as you can see, rules added and all that's the firewall related command output. And now it is creating a Tomcat container called demo. So let's wait and see what it's going to do. So seems it has finished all the network testing and now it's going to install for us um, a Tomcat container uh, for our DHIS2 instance called demo. Okay, so it's seemingly working fine. So like Bob had said, uh, we, our Tomcat is uh, Tomcat 9, as you can see there in the log. <coughs> and um, our Postgres, he says, uh, has been upgraded to Postgres 13. So basically this pulls out the latest um, uh, uh, software, but also of course it's important that we, we check it out. So it seems um, we are actually up and running. Uh, so it, just uh, looking at our containers, uh, what has happened. So now you see our uh, new instances there running. Okay. And um, so you remember our domain name that we created? So if I go here, let's test uh, before we can go far. And then I put this. 
So right now, we don't have any, we have not yet done the deployment, of course, of the DHIS2. And um, just to see that nothing is still showing up and it's not secure, okay? So um, our next step is basically to, since it's a new database, we just uh, probably deploy our war file. Now, um, we have options. If you already have a file uh, that you already downloaded within the, within the environment that you're working in, the host machine, uh, you can pass F <coughs> to allow you to point to the file uh, that you're working with, or you can pass L to define the link where the file is located, okay? And then definitely the name of the instance. So um, since I don't have uh, deploy one, and I don't have the link, I don't have the content, the, the file already down, down on my computer, I can just go and pull out the latest, uh, the latest DHIS2 uh, stable version for now. And then as you can see, I just copy the link. Okay. And say DHIS2 deploy war minus L. And then you defined where it should pick up the war file from. And then say demo. So what I'm saying is that deploy this war file, go, go to DHIS2, download the file, deploy it onto demo, demo instance, demo container, which is basically our DHIS2 instance that we have created. So once I enter this, it will download for me the file and then start the automatic uh, deployment of the war file. It copies, it creates um, a, D, a, 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 a file called dhs.war and then starts to deploy it onto the demo container. So this is a repetitive process that you can always do. And always you can, uh, a log view. If you want, um, you can see the log of what is happening. Uh, you just define from the host machine, define this as log view. Uh, minus F is for a continuous, uh, of course, this one requires a pseudo. Okay. For a continuous, it's like tail minus, uh, like log tail or something, uh, which keeps on running. Uh, when uh, changes are happening. So as you can see, um, it's trying to create for us now. It's deploying for us the war file. And um, it seems uh, so far, everything is okay. With the exception of a common or oh, a common Tomcat error. This is a Tomcat error. It's not a DHIS2 error uh, that we have. So it's not, it's just a Tomcat thing. I need to check with Bob on what's happening. So let's see, wait and see if it can create for us uh, the entire program without any issue. So let's wait and see, it's getting for us doing for us some processes. Okay. Seems to be running uh, stable now. Okay. Uh, hello, Stephen. Hi. 
Hi, I just think we are about 10 minutes over time now. Uh, is it possible cool. to wrap this up in about five minutes or? Uh... Yeah, sure. Great, great. Let's wrap up. Yeah. As you can see guys, uh, we are done with the deployment of DHIS2. Um, so DHIS2 has run uh, successfully. It seems there's no error. Uh, if I can go to that, sorry. That URL that I created, that was just... Oh, uh, we just get the URL, copy link. Uh, we normally uh, require, let me just remove this, okay. Okay, so um, we have to do uh, post uh, installation to make sure that everything is done successfully. Remember uh, this now allow, requires us to put, the whole setup has been set up via HTTPS. Of course, uh, that was not completed yet. As you can see, it's not uh, allowing, but it should be giving us uh, an access from the local here. If I install, um, uh, links, uh, the command line uh, terminal. So uh, going back to the documentation, definitely we have a number of other commands that you, that is important that we run, that we can use always. Uh, you can always stop a container or start a container, a Tomcat container, and then restart um, all those bits. Those, those are all possible commands that are there. Now, what is next left is, uh, and one thing that we, have, we haven't done, maybe we can come back after the break. Are we coming back after the break? I, I believe we're uh, continuing tomorrow. Isn't that uh, right with the schedule? Let me double check oh. that. Uh, yeah, um, it looks like uh, 11.45 GMT was the setup time for today. And tomorrow it's, also 9 GMT to 11.45 GMT. Okay. I, I, I think maybe we need can to extend one of those two uh, timings. Um, can we agree and finish the post installation step, if it is possible? Just these uh, few things, because we have to finish it so that we can see the page running, the system running. Is it agreeable to everyone? Ah, Alice is here now. Uh, Alice, can you? Uh... Yes. Um, given the circumstances, uh, please take all the time you need for this session. That is absolutely fine. We are not in the hurry. So um, take your time and yeah. OK. OK. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank no problem. Yeah. Thank you. OK. So um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the next step is basically to do, we are basically done with the setup. Uh, originally, we had done the entire um, process uh, by just um, uh, automating even the SSL certificate generation. Uh, but of course, we try to be cautious that uh, um, most time people will keep trying to run that script and then they are using only one domain name or subdomain, and then they get limited or they get uh, blocked out by let's encrypt. So um, we try to separate this process. Uh, to make sure that uh, your instance is, is, is not blocked or your subdomain is not blocked from when you are testing out the SSL or, or when you're generating the SSL certificate for that instance. So um, uh, one thing that we definitely uh, we will do is to run, um, so remember uh, we have, uh, four containers now, and uh, accessing the containers is pretty simple. Um, uh, basically, we are going to do the post installation from the proxy server, but when you want to access any other uh, container that is here, uh, you can always use sudo lxc exec, and then the proxy name or the container name, I mean. So for now, we're using proxy, and then you put your command. 
the dash dash just uh, changes just uh, gives you uh, it, it gives the command an, an, an idea that the next the follow on uh, thing is the command that should be used <clears throat> once someone has logged in uh, so um, as you can see i'm now uh, not in the host machine but in the proxy container and within here is a complete new ubuntu 2024 um, uh, server that is already installed with the with our apache server as you can see uh, apache servers are already there and this is only for the proxy server you will not find the apache server on the the demo or monitor or uh, postgres container so one thing that we are expected to do here is to uh, basically uh, we'll test we'll first test out um, uh, our command uh, against the just to generate the ssl certificate we test it against the domain name that we we, we used okay we, using this here you it will allow you to create a, to try as multiple times as possible <clears throat> without being blocked but once once that uh, highlighted uh, parameters is not in it means that you're trying to generate uh, an ssl certificate for production <clears throat> so uh, it's important that when you're testing uh, you have to apply that parameter there and also change the right uh, domain name accordingly uh, so uh, when I come back to my, I'm, I'm already in my proxy server. I just, I'm going to change a few things. Uh, this is your email address uh, that you want the uh, Let's Encrypt and Search Bot to send a uh, notification <coughs> whenever there's any issue, for example, expiry or something like that. So it will send you to so I'm putting that to send me to that. And then I get the domain name that we uh, use. Let me just copy link. So the parameter of D. Indicates that uh, what's the indicates the domain name that you're trying to. Okay. So now I'm saying uh, test for me <coughs> this certificate. If it's successful, <coughs> let me go ahead and create. So let's hit it. Uh, it will show us what uh, what the outcome is. If it is successful, then we should be, of course, we have to agree to the terms and condition. So as you can see, ladies, um, have been saved. I don't know why it's not. Uh, problem binding to port 80, could not bind. Uh, you, you need to stop Apache first, uh, Steven. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Hmm. You need to stop, not not the restart. Pardon? Uh, you you need the system control restart Apache. You need to stop stop Apache. Yeah, that's what I did. Um... Oh, you did re restart. <laughs> you need to stop. Oh, Okay, let me see. Okay, same as we're going to run. Okay, as you can see, guys, um, uh, it's telling us that we have been successful uh, when we're generating the SSS certificate for this uh, domain name. And that means uh, we can now go ahead and generate for us a, a real uh, domain name for, you know, a certificate for for that but of course even the test will store it within the server so what is important that is, is that uh, we have to we have to what uh, delete what we use for so search bot uh, delete it will list for us all the available uh, for those who are used to SSS, uh, ussd uh, you just specify the number of what you want to delete and then 
to delete. And then we run now our command without the test. Okay. Uh, let's run. Okay. Okay. So we have finally uh, generated our SSL certificate uh, using the less encrypt free in SSL certificate. And um, it has been tied to the, to the service. Definitely now we start um, the Apache 2 just to, okay. And uh, we should be able to go to our, the rest of these other commands is basically for mooning, uh, just to attach also um, the DHIS2. Remember we didn't, uh, we didn't attach uh, the Tomcat, uh, the DHIS2 Tomcat. So we have to make sure that it is reloading the entire uh, container that are within so that it gets access to. So if I go to now um, this domain name, sorry. Let me just get through this. Um, yeah, we should be having Me first. Uh, hmm. Protocol error. I don't know why it's not. Okay, let me just. But. I don't know why I'm not able to get this to work here. So let me just install uh, just an online browser. Uh, Just to make sure that I can access uh, the Tomcat from my side. So, links, HTTP. Uh, you can do a demo port 88. That's the default port. It seems to be. Links HTTPS. SSL Aaron. Just ensure that the Tomcat is running as well. Sudo um, LXC exec uh, demo. Okay. Um, so remember, this is not uh, for installation in each of these ones, it's not required, but I'm just trying to ensure that uh, each of these containers are running as expected and uh, we're able to access the other bit. The other bit is just to try to access uh, using a ping command or try to access that you are able to access the other remote container and the like. Uh, so I can try to restart the host machine because it looks like I'm done with the entire these bits. Yeah. And then um, the other thing that is also important is that 
But for now, let me first uh, six. Let me restart the host machine. Um, why did it restart? Uh, the other um, basic configuration that you can use to change uh, to automatically load the the subdomain. You've been seeing me typing slash demo or something um, within the configuration. Uh, within the proxy, uh, there is uh, upstream and all those bit that has to be configured and added. Let me just log in to show you guys. Uh, They're coming up. Okay. So um, we have that uh, inside DHIS2 setup. There are other things uh, that we need to, uh, I think it is in, see, though not edited from here. I just wanted to show you uh, this not one. Okay, so let me log in into to do LXC, exec, uh, proxy, and um, slash, it opens for me, slash terminal. Hmm. What's that? Okay, so I'm in. <clears throat> So inside the ETC Apache, we normally see uh, inside apps. So site enabled, we have this. Uh, uh, so this is not enabled by default. I think there's something that has been, but also if I go to site available, uh, we should be seeing, yes. So what? why our thing is not uh, coming up is because of this is not being enabled by default. I think that is what some changes that has happened. So if I see, if I open this by default, um, we should be able to see at some point where it allows you to, as you can see, they have just put the entire, things already in the SSL certificate, but uh, only that it was not enabled. So um, there's this section that is very important, the right rule that we, we have to always look at. So that uh, especially if you're just having one instance and you don't want people to uh, to type slash, keep on type, typing the, uh, the slash. So what you do, uh, you would, um, and comment this, okay? And then definitely you'd change this from DHIS to maybe the name of your instance or the way the instance has been named. So I put demo, such that once you you install uh, the, once you install, once you, you, you try to access, you should be able to, so let's, Enable this site. Uh, you there are also there are, there are normally commands that you can do. Uh, they, they call it az something to site enable to enable a site. The other option is just to copy to do a, a symbolic link of your file, making sure that it's in the sites enabled, and then it will automatically. And when you once you restart your Tomcat, you should be able to run. 
Oh, no, I mean Apache. Uh, so site, let me just go to sites, uh, symbolic link. Symbolic link. I go to sites available and I say Apache. What is there? Apache dhistory.conf. So in our site enable now, we have two sites, as you can see. We have enabled um, the Apache DHIS2 conf. And uh, now if I restart, I think if nothing else is the problem, we should be able to access our DHIS2 instance as that. So this is a complete running um, DHIS2 now running um, under the various LXD containers that have been separated. Uh, like Bob has hinted out is that uh, the concept of the containers allows you to manage uh, resources in a more, in a more what? Uh, in, in a more flexible way, uh, such that you can only maybe allocate a small amount of uh, memory or resource uh, to a container that does not require much, but also focus more of your resources to, to the one that that is that is very um, heavy or that is over consuming. As you can see, our system is fully um, secure uh, using the, XS, uh, the SSL certificate, and um, basically we have a, a complete. Uh, secure system right from the from the server side uh, where we've tried to at least try to <clears throat> prevent root access we try to prevent um, um, default port access we try to you know um, go further uh, just recently an interesting one came in uh, i think we will add it in here where we only want the, the proxy server like here now we have um, we have port 88. Um, so now when I do this, it's not I'm not accessing directly from. Uh, I hope it, it will access or not. It may not access. So um, from Uganda we had a scenario where uh, we use an, an, a different setup and uh, we were able to access you know this uh, system directly from the port. Um, but of course it would i think this has been taken care of as you can see it's not accessible but rather because of the firewalls that we have put in uh, to give the flow and all those bits port 88 is not a, is not among the one that has been allowed from outside of the of the containers it's only through the proxy that you get into the, the other containers uh, and and have you so this is what we have. As you can see, we have a full running site. Any question or comments before we can close for the day, I think. Very good presentation, Stephen. Yes, thank, thank you so you. much, Stephen, for this presentation. And I think we have Slack um, that we are heavily using. So in any case, if there is any questions or um, you, can, you can post it on Slack and we will try to, to reply as soon as possible.